Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. Prior to this announcement on Monday of their new budget, uh, they were staffing police at six branches, five of which are in majority black neighborhoods in North County, um, one of which is in South County. So um, this is how we got started, Sarah, in response to the uprisings and applying Black Lives Matter to our library. Um, We started out with an internal petition that got 50 staff signatures on it. Um, that was met with intimidation and targeting from our administration. And, and what do you um, mean by that? What, what intimidation and targeting? Um, to be honest, Sarah, our organizing led to the firings. That's what we believe strongly. I'm Sarah Fudsky. This is St. Louis on the Air. Earlier this year, the St. Louis County Library System laid off 122 staffers. All were part-time, and all had been with the library four years or less. The layoffs, the library said, were based strictly on seniority. But in recent years, the library has made a push to hire more employees of color. And so using seniority meant minority employees were disproportionately affected. And now the terminations have only brought more fuel to a group calling for changes within the county library system, many of those changes focused on racial equity. And joining me today to talk about this movement are two people involved with it. Julia Singley is a full-time employee with the St. Louis County Library. Julia, welcome. Hi, Sarah. Thank you. And we're also joined today by Mara Leiden. She was a part-time library employee beginning in November of 2018, and she was laid off along with so many others in August. Mara, welcome. Hi, how are you doing? And I do want to mention we invited library administrators to join us on this show. They declined, and we'll get to what they said in a statement in, in just a bit. But Mara, I want to start with you. Tell us about the day you lost your job. What happened there? Sure. So I was eating lunch, getting ready to go in for my one o'clock shift. And I was called by a manager. I actually missed her first call. And I had assumed it was maybe someone had tested positive. We'd been having a couple of COVID cases lately. And she very, she'd had to call nine other employees at my branch. Mm. We lost fully half of our staff because um, I used to work at Merrimack Valley. And we had just opened up a huge expansion last May And so we had obviously hired a ton of people to staff that expansion. And so we lost a a huge majority of our workers in the seniority layoffs. Mm -hmm. And so by the time she got to be, she was very calm and dead faced and, and just said that you couldn't, I couldn't come into work and that I couldn't come in to say goodbye to any of my coworkers and that they would uh, be mailing my locker contents to me. Oh, that's hard. That's really hard. And I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, those those calls are always awful. It sounds like particularly mm. awful in a pandemic. Um, you mm. were one of 122 that was laid off. Um, were you in touch? Did you get a, a sense of just um, how big this group was and, and how many people were affected um, that very day? Yeah, well, I think so, because I immediately started texting my coworkers um, and saying, hey, what's going on? What's happening? And I think because our branch was so heavily affected that I knew right away that this was a really big move. Mm -hmm. I didn't know quite how big until a couple of days later when we realized that uh, almost fully half of the part-time front-facing workers had been laid off. Hmm. Now, my understanding is that even before this, you were part of a group of library employees that had come together. This group calls itself Libraries for All STL. Uh, Julia, what originally brought this group together? Yeah, um, Sarah, if it's okay, I'd actually like to start with an acknowledgement here. Mara and I wouldn't be speaking with you if it weren't for all the people who have supported us, who uh, have prepared the ground for us to really plant these seeds. So um, we wouldn't be speaking with you if it weren't for black people across time who've rebelled against white supremacy, in particular, everyone who's in the streets during the uprising for black lives this summer. Um, in our region, people who participated in the Ferguson uprising for um, black library workers in our region who have resisted. Um, as well as for Black-led organizations like Action St. Louis, Arch City Defenders, and Close the Workhouse Campaign. Um, 
as well as black members of Libraries for All. So I just, I, I needed to start with that, Sarah, and just say that we see these people and we're thankful for them. But actually, this kind of speaks to your question too, Sarah. We got started um, after the police killings of black people this summer. We came together, we said, why, uh, this is a crisis. Our patrons are being murdered by police. And this is a crisis that we absolutely have to address in our libraries. Um, we, our libraries are using taxpayer money. In fact, here at St. Louis County Library spends over half a million dollars each year to staff police. Um, prior to this announcement on Monday of their new budget, uh, they were staffing police at six branches, five of which are in majority black neighborhoods in North County, um, one of which is in South County. So um, this is how we got started, Sarah, in response to the uprisings and applying Black Lives Matter to our library. Um, we started out with an internal petition that got 50 staff signatures on it um, that was met with intimidation and targeting from our administration. And, and what do you um, mean by that? What, what intimidation and targeting? Um, to be honest, Sarah, our organizing led to the firings. That's what we believe strongly. Um, we had this petition. We were told to take the petition down. Um, we decided, okay, our internal efforts have failed. We'd all spoken. I mean, we've tried so many times to communicate with management, to communicate with library leadership. Um, we and dis Julie, if you don't mind, I can speak to this too. Um, I, I found, signed the petition and I shared it to everyone in our branch using our branch email address. And I was almost immediately called to the manager's office and said, I couldn't, and told, uh, that I can't believe that you would sign this petition. How dare you acknowledge this? And this is not what we think at the library. And this is absolutely unacceptable. Um, and I... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, that's... Go ahead. Um, Julia was saying that approximately 50 people signed that first petition. I know there were 122 of you that were laid off. Was there significant overlap between the list of workers who were laid off and the people that had signed this petition? Um, perhaps, Sarah, there was actually more overlap between, um, so Director Kristen Sorth had communicated, um, that, so we're also, we're talking about two pandemics here, right? We're talking about police murders of black people. Um, we're also talking about COVID-19. The fact that in this region, there was a time that only black people had died from COVID-19. Um, so we're talking about both of these pandemics happening at the same time, right? We're getting these emails um, one after the other this summer that, um, branch after branch has employees have tested positive for COVID-19. So in response to some of these emails um, that went to all staff, our employees wrote back, our coworkers wrote back and said, this isn't okay. We don't feel safe. How are we still getting sick? And y'all are sending the same information over and over again, and you're not planning to change anything. Um, and it was actually, Sarah, a lot of those people who ended up being fired. So people who were concerned about being there in person during this pandemic and, and the safety of, of that. That's correct. I, I would say not just being there in person, but the ways that we don't feel heard by the library, um, the ways that we don't feel like they're doing everything they could possibly do to keep us safe. Um, one thing on this note, Sarah, I'd like to bring up is actually the library has listed um, flex scheduling as one of their COVID-19 practices. And that's something that my department did use at the beginning, but quickly we had to um, all come back full time. Uh, to define that flex scheduling means like, for example, I'm a full-time employee, so I work 40 hours a week, but flex scheduling means, okay, they could schedule me for 20 hours. So I could work half my hours, but I'm still gonna get full pay. Mm -hmm. um, so they listed flex scheduling as something that was possible to use and have barely used it. Um, and in fact, they're only using it now ba based on the um, the county's new guidelines that to li that limit 10 people to an indoor gathering. Um, but it, it feels, I mean, it's it just feels violent, Sarah, that we're using it now. Um, when all these staff are fired, many branches are understaffed. Um, my personal experiences are that they moved half of my coworkers out to branches to, in order to fill in for the people that they fired, which means that I'm running an entire preschool delivery service on my own. That's not something that I signed up to do. Um, I have chronic back pain. I identify as disabled. Um, people at branches are walking excessive amount of miles every day. And 
flex scheduling means that we're going to have le even less people in the building, less people to do meal distribution, less people to offer curbside service. How can we do flex scheduling when we don't have fully staffed libraries? It's just it just feels like yet another way that um, the library is wearing down our bodies, wearing down our spirits and our morale, which all ultimately makes us more susceptible to COVID. My guests today are pressing for changes at the St. Louis County Library. They're part of a group called Libraries for All STL, and that includes Julia Singley, uh, who is still employed by the library full-time. We're also joined by Mara Leiden, who was laid off in August. And we do want to acknowledge we um, sought to see if library administrators would share their perspective on this show. Uh, they declined that invitation, but they did send us a long statement. I'm going to read a part of it. It was, it was so long. If I read it, it would take up most of the show, but there's a couple key highlights here I do want to share with people. Uh, the library writes, the COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically changed library service. St. Louis County Library has made some extremely difficult decisions as a result, while still meeting the needs of our community and keeping our patrons and employees safe. This year, we have also been engaged in an ongoing dialogue around the critically important issue of racial equity with staff, community partners, and patrons. Throughout the pandemic, we have provided critical resources to our community, including distributing over one million drive through meals in our branch parking lots with Operation food search, providing emergency diapers and period supply kits from the St. Louis area diaper bank, and issuing thousands of Chromebooks and Wi-Fi hotspots to area students to assist with virtual learning through the Digital Equity Initiative. Um, the library mentions that circulation, in their statement, they say circulation is down 47 percent compared to this time last year. They say prior to COVID, our 20 library branches were open 1,300-something hours a week. Currently, we're only open 560 hours per week. We're considering a reduction in curbside hours in response to the spread of COVID-19 in the region. And, and Julie, I'd love to get your reaction to that. Doesn't that mean that there probably is going to have to be fewer employees at that point? Um, I mean, Sarah, this is an interesting question. Our community arguably has needs more from the library than ever. Um, Another thing that the library initially mentioned to press when they announced the the firings was that they were they were making these decisions. A reduct basically the logic was that a reduction of services means a reduction of staff. Mm -hmm. And they said, "quote We're being good stewards of taxpayer dollars." Um, we at Libraries for All we really believe this is this is not an argument that they can make, and in fact is violent to say so. Um, no taxpayer asked for the firing of 122 people during a pandemic. This is the largest mass firing in, in St. Louis County Library history. Hmm. Um, and to be clear, Sarah, we're also using the, the, the term firing instead of layoff. Um, I think layoff is a much more passive, kind of like this was inevitable. Um, but firing is <laughs> is really what happened is that these people who weren't even making a living wage, who didn't have health insurance through the library, who were the best librarians that we could have ever asked for. These were people who were hired under a strategic plan under um, that. I think it was passed in October 2018 um, that said we're going to hire people who represent the communities they serve. Um, so I, I just wanted to clarify, we're using the language of firings because that's exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. um, this wasn't a furlough situation where they're saying we might come back to this later. They're mm -hmm. saying you're gone. Here's, here's your walking no, papers. Sarah, it wasn't. And um, I, I mean, if, just to put some cherries on top here, our director, Kristen Sorth, ha held town hall meetings um, and promised people in these meetings, your jobs are safe. I'm going to do, I, I mean, I heard from administration, I'm going to do every, we're going to do everything we can to keep all of our staff here. And then um, this happened. There, mm -hmm, look, there's one other right. issue that, that we have uh, just glancingly referred to that I feel like is, is important to talk about here. And this is the issue involving off-duty police officers um, being staffed at library branches. I understand mm -hmm. this is something that was very important to Libraries for All. Mara, can, can you talk to us a bit about the concerns about that that the group had? Yeah. So, I mean, that was the original focus of the group until it was kind of overshadowed by the firings. Um, and... I, I understand that the uh, the 2021 proposed budget ends that contract uh, with off-duty police officers. And this is a fiscal year, so this is going to be happening now going forward. Those officers are gone. Yeah, well, it was happening even before now, uh, which is something the library and like the library administration t tried to kind of toss at us as mm -hmm. for a bone was that due to COVID, they were no longer staffing those branches with police officers because no one was allowed in the branches. Uh, and that, right. that language was 
Yeah, they used very soft language to refer to that in the beginning. So no one was really sure if like that contract was actually ended or if it was just suspended. Uh, I am heartened by the proposed budget uh, that eliminates that um, that contract, but mm-hmm. it remains to be seen whether or not these internal security officers what what that program is going to look like. Who who might be providing some sort of security now that they've canceled that contract? Exactly. Yeah. Question. Okay. And do you feel that the fact that the library has pulled the plug on this, even if they're not directly connecting it to your efforts, do you feel like maybe the the, um, the attention you brought to this facilitated oh, that change? Absolutely. Yes. Our petition, our public petition, got more than twelve hundred signatures on it. We have had over a hundred public comments submitted to the board meetings in support of our efforts. And even though the library and the board of directors have kind of gone out of their way to minimize the contribution we've made. This would never have happened without our efforts and the efforts of our community who have so generously supported us. So I do also want to mention one other thing, and that is that when we um, uh, announced that we were going to have this conversation with you today, we did hear from a number of library employees. We actually heard from, I believe, at least three that used their actual names and said that they are employees of color that work for the St. Louis County Library System, and they said they don't support this group. Um, Somebody named Crystal Harris wrote us, and she said, I'm angry and frustrated. I have witnessed the libraries for all online group continuously attempt to vilify library administration and board members all in the name of black people. Instead of focusing much needed energy on the truly frightening social justice issues in STL, they have chosen to recklessly and irresponsibly scream white supremacy at any opinion that is not their own and ignorantly proclaim opinions as facts and assumptions as truth. And and she goes on from there. I'm curious to hear your reaction to that. Uh, Julia, I'm (laughs) Oh, sorry. Either of you. <laughs> Julie, if you want yeah. to take the lead, great. Or Mara. Um, okay. Yeah, Crystal's actually my manager. So that that's, um, it's, it's tough to hear and tough to respond to. But that's actually, she brings up a point that I, I want to talk about, Sarah, is that these, these issues, policing, COVID, the firings, they're all connected under this umbrella of white supremacy. They're all connected to the culture that we're trying to change at St. Louis County Library that is one of fear and intimidation. We can't speak openly about these issues. Our coworkers are being tokenized. I mean, the worst has already happened <laughs> to people that we know and love. Uh, our people are getting sick. We're getting exposed to COVID. Um, our people have been fired. Um, as, <laughs> as far as policing goes, Sarah, not everyone has to agree with us and we're not out here acting like, oh, we represent everybody at St. Louis County Library. We're not even saying we represent all black people who work at St. Louis County Library. Um, But we have anecdotal evidence as well as data from across the country that shows that police and libraries, police do not make our libraries more safe. Mm -hmm. Police do not make our patrons feel safe. Um, I mean, youth from North County have written public comments and have said, this is my experience of police at libraries. I had an officer uh, follow me. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I treat everybody with respect. I wasn't doing nothing wrong. And um, this officer just started following me. And that is what we see, those of us who work in libraries with police. I mean, the other piece to tease out here, Sarah, is taxpayers don't want over $500 million a year spent on, sorry, $500,000 a year spent on police that harass and terrorize black and brown youth. Mm-hmm. And it, look, it does seem like on this uh, on this policing issue, um, you've been a part of, I don't know, the library might say it's independent, but there's changes coming. And, and it sounds like your group um, can, can take some pride in that. What do you see mm-hmm. as your next focuses now that it sounds like, yeah, they're not renewing that contract? Uh, Mara, do you want to speak to, to what a, a future focus looks like? Yeah, so I mean, it's a little tough um, because I'm no longer employed there. Uh, What I want to see as a patron, purely from a public standpoint, is uh, libraries that are more, have more input from the communities they serve. And something that I think has struck me from this library administration, especially, is that they are, it's kind of a top down decision. And so they they are making sweeping decisions about what will work best without asking the people that they're serving. And so I, what one of our original demands was to commit that 
$500,000 to a participatory budgeting process in which community members and partners can speak as to what they feel a safe library looks like. And I think that is the next step, not necessarily just like hiring internal security officers, but really speaking to the these branches where um, there is more crime in the area and saying, how do we make the library a, a safe place? Hmm. Well, uh, we are going to keep an eye on that uh, on that goal as you continue to work towards that, and we hope that you'll continue to uh, keep us apprised of your efforts. So, Mara Leiden, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And Julia Singley, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sarah, if I can write quick, um, anyone who's listening, we're at librariesforallstl.org. Um, thank you to everyone who supported us. Um, to the library, we want to say we're not anti-library. In fact, we're pro-library and we love what we do so much that we want to see our libraries be pro-black as well. Um, thanks for having us. Thank you, Julia. And we do want to remind people, we did ask the St. Louis County Library Administration to be a part of the show. They declined. You can read some highlights from their lengthy statement on our website. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com.